Welcome everybody to today's uh, CVMA Veterinary Town Hall series. Uh, I understand we haven't seen each other since before the holidays, so it's really great to be back. I hope everyone is well and uh, still getting through this very strange and difficult time. Uh, it is our pleasure from the entire CVMA to be able to offer these webinars. And uh, today's subject, of course, as we have recurring, is navigating through COVID-19. And our speaker today is, of course, Dr. Scott Wies. And we just want to say a big thank you to Dr. Wies for helping us with these webinars uh, throughout the year. It is truly impossible to believe that it has been almost a year uh, that we have been dealing with COVID in our country. And uh, I, I certainly had not wished to be in this particular situation still, but we are and we're doing the best of it. I would like to remind many of you as well that we have uh, our COVID landing page, which is on the CVMA website. So please, for any of the most recent updates uh, and for, of course, uh, recordings of some of our webinars, any recent updates that might be coming through from our working group, et cetera, please go there. It's an excellent resource for everyone. So, to just get to the next part, which is just to remind everybody. So uh, Lori, who's our, uh, on this call today, is going to be muting everybody. But if for some reason that uh, doesn't happen and you unmute yourself, please just repress your mute. This session is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch this again or let your friends and colleagues know. Uh, we do encourage you also to be using the chat box for your questions along the way. Dr. Weiss is incredible at checking these during his presentation, but I will also be keeping a, a good look at them as well. We may not get to every single one of the questions, but usually we do a very good job at, uh, at getting through. So thank you. And I'm going to pass this on now to, uh, to Dr. Weiss and we'll Great. let that go. There we go. OK, Just give me a second to pull some slides up here. Thanks for joining in, everyone. Computer's not overly fast. OK, almost there. So today, I've got kind of a mishmash of updates. So slides should be there in a sec. If they're not, someone can let me know. But yeah, I'm going to cover a few different topics. It's, you know, I'm not going to do everything about COVID. It's what do we know differently than kind of what we knew last time. So like you said, please toss things in the chat. Um, I'll keep checking that as we go through. So I'm gonna hit on a few things. Where are we now? And why are we concerned about where we are now? Because that really impacts what we're thinking about. Uh, we're gonna have to do over the next few months. You know, the, the end is near, not that end, the end of this pandemic, um, but we aren't there yet. And this kind of explains why we need to you know, suck it up and push through a few more months. You know, I've been saying for the last little while, the next couple of weeks are really the key for this pandemic or how we see it finishing off. Um, we do have some concerning indicators and we really need to maintain some diligence over the next couple of months. Uh, with the vaccines, we do have an end in sight. So I'm gonna talk about that. We'll get into some updates on the animal side. Uh, some things about you know vaccination, handling exposed animals, kind of a, a mix of topics. But this is the state, this, sorry, it's a bit Ontario biased, some of the data, just because I have better Ontario data. So we very clearly had you know, a second wave and that second wave very clearly peaked and has decreased. And the problem is where we are right now. And obviously this is Ontario, but this isn't the only place that's happening. We've had this nice decline, nice decline in deaths correspondingly, but then we hit a plateau and that plateau has been at a pretty high level. You're looking about a thousand cases a day in Ontario. And we've been waiting for it to rise and you know it probably is starting right now. So the question is, have we hit the second wave and we're gonna be at a plateau for a while, which still isn't a great number, but maybe a, a passable number, or are we at the start of a third wave, which has been seen in many, many countries. And unfortunately, it's probably more of the latter. Uh, looking at r naught, so the effective reproduction number. So like I said, this virus normally infects, the average person infects two or so people but we do a lot of things to reduce that. And if we can keep that actual transmission below one, you know, that would break waves. If it's above one, it goes up. And we did have it below one for a while, uh, and now it's come back above one because of various things, variants of concern that I'll focus on a little bit because of increasing openness, pandemic fatigue, all of these things. But once we start heading into this above one range, we're gonna start seeing more of an, an increase. 
And it's obviously different across the country. Uh, this is effective transmission rates from a couple of days ago for different areas across Canada. And these can be fairly labile. They can jump up and down, especially in areas where there aren't many cases. You can go from a pretty low number to a pretty high number and back to a low number quickly. But we certainly see, you know, overall we're hanging around that one, but concerningly enough above one in enough areas that we've got something to, to be worried about. Now, there are a couple issues here. One, we're really worried about severity. We're not worried about absolute numbers of cases as much. We're worried about people that die, people that get hospitalized and the impacts on the healthcare system. So this is critical COVID uh, capacity, basically numbers for Ontario is looking at the number of people in ICU with critical uh, real illness related to COVID. And our numbers are still pretty high. So we're in the 300 and some range. This is the dump I got yesterday, I think, or the day before. So it's still a large number of people in hospital with COVID-related illness, especially when you look back into the summer, we had very few people in hospital in ICU with COVID. And you know, it's come down from where that peak was in January, but we've started to inch up a little bit. Uh, the other thing that we're sort of pay attention to is the numbers in Ontario. These numbers are fudged a little bit by the province. And this isn't, isn't just in Ontario, no, at least one of the provinces that does this. In Ontario, when someone's been in ICU for 14 days or been in hospital for 14 days, they're no longer considered a COVID patient because they figure they're not infectious at that point. They're in ICU because they have COVID, but they're not counted in the census. So if you look at provincial numbers, provincial numbers may be 50 or so off from the actual critical care count. Um, just if you're paying attention to numbers and seeing discrepancies in numbers, uh, that's one explanation. So a lot of the concern and a lot of the change that we're seeing right now is based on these variants of concern. So you've heard about variants of concern, right, or VOCs. These are just normal mutations, viruses mutate. And the more they replicate, the more they mutate. So the more fuel of the fire, the more risk we have of new mutants. So when you have a lot of transmission, you're going to see changes in this virus. And sometimes these changes are good for the virus and sometimes they're, they're bad for the virus, but it's the ones that are good for the virus that are of concern to us, obviously because that can make them more transmissible, uh, can impact our ability to prevent them through vaccination or treat them through monoclonal antibody-based treatments, uh, potentially impact tests. This doesn't seem to be that big of a deal. Uh, likelihood of reinfection is a big issue. If people are infected with the normal strain, if they can be reinfected by a variant, then we've kind of reset our herd immunity numbers. And maybe chase changes in host range, so bringing more of the animal side, we really don't know much about that, but it's something that, that comes up. Now, what do these VOCs do? Well, they're a significant concern if we look what's happened internationally. If you look at the UK, they had their first wave, they had their second wave, then they had a big third wave. And this was a mess. If you talk to people trying to deal with this in the, in the human healthcare system, this was a, a, a tremendously challenging situation and they're still quite restricted in the UK because of this. Now, look at our graph. We had one bump, we had another bump. The question is, are we right here heading into a big third wave or are we right here heading into maybe a smaller third wave or a decline? And we don't know, right? We can't predict whether this is going to happen. But that's why there's a lot of concerns. We want to make sure this doesn't happen. Uh, another example is Newfoundland. So Newfoundland, like a lot of Atlantic Canada, has done an exceptional job of controlling this virus. You see numbers were low, 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 low until there was an outbreak. And that was a variant of concern. So you can see things change very dramatically um, because of these. Now back to that critical illness graph, just one thing to put perspective why we're worried about these things. Wave two, look at our hospitalization numbers, our ICU numbers, we're very low, you know, in the 20s. If this is wave three and we're starting at 300, that's a huge issue. The numbers of people uh, that are impacted by hospital issues right now are pretty substantial. Uh, there'll be some data released for Ontario tomorrow talking about the numbers of, of people that are on waiting lists. It's the number of surgeries that have been delayed a uh, number of imaging procedures that have been delayed and the numbers are pretty massive. But we have already got huge impacts to the healthcare system. And if we add a third wave onto a big baseline, um, we could be in a worse scenario than what we had with our second wave. Just to show some of the issues with these VOCs, uh, this is an outbreak in a long-term care facility in Barrie. 55 cases identified in the first 48 hours. Eventually all the residents got infected and 71 of the 129 died. Uh, most of the staff got infected. And this was a variant. This was the UK, the B117 variant. And I'll talk a little bit about those as we go along, just save a little bit of understanding why we're concerned about different variants and what they do differently. Uh, so B117, the, the UK variant, 
This is a dominant variant, kind of in most areas. If, if, where we have variants building up, this is the most common one. It originated in the UK. It is more transmissible, 40, 50 percent. You'll see some ranges between 30 and 70 percent more transmissible. And that's a big deal. Because if you think about that R naught RT, right? We got R naught or RT down, the effective transmission below one for a little while. But if you have a more transmissible strain, you have to knock it down even more because the level we had achieved to bring the normal strain down and drop that second wave might not be effective enough for this one. So if you've got a more transmissible variant, um, you need to do more. Whether it causes more severe disease is still a bit controversial. There's some evidence that it does, there's some that it doesn't, but really the big concern is more cases. More cases mean more serious illness, it means more stress in the hospital system. Um, good thing about this uh, strain is vaccines work against it. It doesn't seem to impact vaccine response with any of the vaccines that we have. But this is well established in Canada and I'll show a graph of that later on. Uh, another one of concern, B3511 uh, from South Africa. So this one is present in Canada. It's also more transmissible. It doesn't seem to cause more severe disease, but there are some potential concerns with vaccination. Uh, mainly that's focused, focused on the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, Pfizer, and Pfizer and Moderna seem okay. They've been tweaking Moderna at least, I believe, for this strain. Johnson & Johnson probably is good with this one. There's not as clear data on it. But um, you know, the transmissibility is maybe the bigger issue than the vaccine response. Now, where the vaccine response probably comes most into play is with a single dose, especially with the AZ vaccine. So if you get a vaccine that's already not great, and you've got a lot of population that's only had one dose, that might have more of an impact where you might get away with it more with the B117 or our normal wild type strain. And then there's P1. This one's I think, more of a concern. This is a strain found in Brazil and it is found in Canada. It's not, there aren't that many cases in Canada so far. And where this originated, where it was identified as a problem was in Manaus. And it was a severely affected city in the first round of COVID where the majority of people were assumed to have been affected or known to have been affected. And then there was another outbreak that came in later on with this strain. So it looks like it's got a reasonable ability to infect people that had previously recovered from COVID, which we were hoping you know, natural infection would confer at least reasonable degree uh, of protection. So that raises concern about the impact of vaccination, right? So if you can break through natural antibodies, what does that do for vaccine antibodies? Uh, just the other day, Pfizer said that in vitro, their vaccine antibodies will neutralize P1. Doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work in vivo, but it was a good sign. So maybe it's not as much of a concern, but it is a bit of an unknown. And then the other question is what else is out there? So, you know, there's a California strain talked about, there's a New York strain that's been talked about. Anywhere you've got a lot of transmission, you're gonna have a greater chance of mutants emerging. And you get in some situations where there's maybe a concern when you've got a lot of transmission, but a reasonable vaccine coverage, or at least partial vaccine coverage in the US might be the classic place for that. You know, vaccines don't make vaccine mutant strains. But if you've got lots of mutations happening in the population because there's so much transmission, and one of those happens to be a vaccine resistant strain, you're gonna select for that with the degree of vaccine coverage that's out there. So it, we're in a bit of a, you know, a concerning time with that in some areas where vaccination is ramping up. You've got a lot of people with one dose, a lot of people that may not go back for their second dose if they're not motivated, but enough transmission for mutants to emerge. So the, the BOC story certainly isn't done with the ones that we know about right now. We don't have great understanding of what's going on in Canada. It's getting better over the last few weeks. Surveillance hasn't typically been great. It's been geared up. Um, you know, we may have a Canadian variant we don't know about. There may be a Canadian variant to emerge, but we do know they're causing problems. Um, this kind of relates back to the P1 strain. So this is a map of Brazil and this is ICU capacity. And you can see how the ICU capacity you know, it was fairly good in the, in the fall. Uh, red obviously means more. And by now they've got critical ICU capacity through a bunch of the country. And a lot of this is because of the emergence of this variant. Now, where do we stand in Canada? So these are Ontario data uh, and our percentage of VOCs is coming up quite dramatically. And that's what the, the purple line is. That's the percent uh, of, of specimens that, have, uh, that are mutants. So this is looking for the mutation that's present in a couple of these VOCs. So we're seeing a much higher and pretty steadily increasing percentage of infections that are caused by VOCs. And if you look at the modeling that was done when these started to emerge, the modeling is pretty bang on with this. 
And once you hit 50% is kind of when you get the badness area. There's a lag. So it takes time for those VOCs to build up. It takes time for the impact of that to be reflected in increasing number of cases. Um, but once you hit that 50% threshold, that's when it really starts to become a problem. And back in January, with the initial modeling, as, as these cases were just starting to be identified, the thought was in Ontario, okay, you know, March, mid-March to late March is when it's going to hit. And you know, the concern is we might be there. We might have hit that plateau. And now we're increasing because what we were doing to control the normal strain isn't enough to control the variants. VOCs in animals, we have no clue. Um, but we're still going, we're still working on our surveillance. We are sequencing any isolates or any, any positive samples we get from dogs and cats. We just don't have a lot of them because our PCR based surveillance is still pretty limited. We have no idea if they're more susceptible or less susceptible, but change is what it does to them clinically. Presumably it increases transmissibility to animals too. Um, animals that are already susceptible, but we just don't know. Another concern is whether it might expand their host range into some wildlife species that we think aren't susceptible right now. So overall, uh, VOCs are they're definitely a concern. They're not the end of the world. Um, they are controllable just like other strains of, of COVID, but you just need to do it better. So we don't have to do anything different. We just have to do what we're doing now to a better degree and improve compliance with what we're supposed to be doing now. Uh, so that, that basically says it here, right? So control measures are, are essentially the same. Uh, it's just better. There's less margin for error. Things that were allowing us to hold things steady a month ago, two months ago, aren't going to be enough for us to hold things steady now. Obviously, that's a concern because in a lot of areas, we're opening up. Um, and, or we're getting decreased compliance because of pandemic fatigue. Model or data from mobility from cell phones in Ontario shows that you know the last couple of weeks we've reverted fairly close to where we were um, before the pandemic, or at least at the beginning of it last year. So mobility's gone up a lot. So we've got a few things coming together right now, which is why I say this next couple of weeks will really tell us where we're going. Uh, I'm gonna take, I'll pause here for the chat if there are any other questions, toss them in now. So if, if a person has had COVID, is natural immunity going to be enough or should they be vaccinated? We don't really know yet. Um, natural immunity is gonna give some degree of immunity. We don't know how good it is. And we don't know how long, obviously, because the virus hasn't been around long enough. There's been some discussion where people that have had a natural infection may only need a single dose of vaccine because they were already primed and they might be able to get by with a single dose, allow, allowing sparing of some of the other doses. We don't know that. That's just kind of been a logical guess, but um, it's one of the big unknowns. So the general, the line still is that if you've been infected, you should get vaccinated, but you're probably lower on the priority list. So if you're a low risk person and you've had COVID, you would be pretty much in the bottom of the pecking order in terms of who should get vaccinated. If you're an elderly person and you survived COVID, uh, you would still like to get vaccinated because we're not gonna trust your vaccine immunities to be protective. So high risk groups in particular get treated like normal. Low risk groups, you might see some more push towards saying go with a single dose. Um, on the national last night, a physician said vaccine induced immunity would be better than that from a natural infection. Well, we don't know if it would be, we're hoping it would be. Uh, we're hoping it is. The vaccines are really good. Like it's amazing how good these vaccines are. Typically, you know, in fact, we don't really rely on vaccines to be better than natural immunity, but this is a situation where they might be. So certainly reinfections happen. We don't know how often they happen. Um, and we don't know if they're happening because of VOCs or infection with the same strain. But there seems to be a reasonably good natural protection, at least for a while. Now, does that mean three months? Does it mean six months? Does it mean 10 years? We don't really know. And time will tell. Uh, another question there, what's the impact of or importance of delaying the second dose beyond 21 days? And this is really controversial, right? So as you've probably seen uh, with the AstraZeneca, the general discussion of, of delaying vaccines. One thing think about, think about when we're giving vaccines, right? And we've had this discussion with our animal vaccines and with delays. Why do we try to have a fairly condensed interval? We try to get that second dose not long after the first dose. Well, that's not necessarily a biological reason. It's because I want a second dose into that individual as soon as I can to get them protected really well. It doesn't mean that after a month, their ability to respond to that second vaccine wanes. And actually, they might have a better ability to respond later. And that was shown initially with AstraZeneca's trial, uh, where there's suspicion that going longer might actually give you a better response. And immunologically, it does make sense um, that you, you know, if had more of an immune response developing 
and maybe a little longer interval will be useful. So in Canada, I think pretty much across Canada now, the recommendation has been to start stretching out intervals to four months. That's the vaccine sparing thing predominantly. Maybe we'll find that it gave us better protection. Now you're trying to balance things out, right? So getting that second dose into the person will give them better immunity than the single dose. But it means you're not vaccinating someone else. So, you know, one person is going to get a whole lot more protection by getting that dose as their first dose, as opposed to someone else using that as their second dose. If we had all the vaccine in the world, we'd stick with the label dose. Um, and ideally there'd be some studies seeing if we get better with longer intervals, but it comes down to a question of, are we better getting vaccines into more arms with delayed intervals? And the modeling supports that, right? You're gonna get more overall protection if you get more people vaccinated, even though, you know, maybe, maybe decreased response. Probably the big concern really is you've got more people that are moderately susceptible after their first dose. Now, the big thing though, is they're, they're more susceptible to infection after the first dose than it would be the second dose, but they're still very well protected from severe disease. And that's, we have to make sure we separate those two things. Getting sick is one thing, getting severe disease is another. Like flu-like illness, you know, you don't want it, but if we get more people to get flu-like illness and fewer people that die, then that's still a big population benefit. Oh, question about staff and, and staffing and vaccination. Maybe I'll try to hit that at the end. I've got a slide where I talk a little bit about some issues with clinics. So if I don't hit that, you need to bring it back up. Uh, any thoughts about the change in the amount of risk of adverse vaccine reactions as repeated vaccination occurs? Well, I guess it depends on what you mean by repeated vaccination. We start talking about long-term, um, whether we need this every year or not. Like these vaccines are incredibly safe. They've been administered to a lot of people with a lot of scrutiny. There've been a lot of people internationally that have gotten the proper two dose course. And the number of severe adverse reactions are exceptionally low. Like it's, it's amazing how low the adverse event rate is actually for these vaccines. Like the, the mild, you know, my arm hurts. I feel a little bit crappy. That, that's very common with these. But severe adverse reactions seem to be really, really rare. Uh, will there be any concerns about if this has to be done yearly? It's hard to say. I don't think we can really say a lot at this point um, beyond the fact that everyone's pretty happy at how safe these vaccines seem to be, especially for a vaccine that's really effective. All right, so keep tossing things in the chat. And if I haven't answered your question well enough, um, jump back to it. Um, what in J&J &J vaccine makes it not require a second dose? And, you know, it's a good question there. Is, is it a function of the vaccine or is it a function of the trial? Right? Like, do, does it, are we saying that J&J &J is the only vaccine that requires one dose? Or are we saying it's the only one that's been properly studied for one dose? Because J&J is on the same platform as AstraZeneca. So it makes you wonder whether, again, and this kind of comes back into those other discussions, right? If J&J &J works with a single dose in the same platform as the AZ vaccine, maybe the AZ vaccine is actually quite good at a single dose. And conversely, the J&J &J vaccine, they're looking at the second dose efficacy because the J&J vaccine is not as effective at pre as preventing overall symptomatic infection as the other vaccines. So it might be that, you know, J&J actually is fairly similar to AZ overall. It's just how they've done the trial. Um, trials were done differently, durations were done differently, things like that. So um, it may just be a function that these vaccines actually develop a, develop a pretty good response. And if they'd only tested these other ones with one dose, maybe they, uh, maybe they would have worked as well. It's a good question. I don't think we have an answer. Uh, I guess one more question there, hairstylist appointment reminder said, if I'm vaccinated within two weeks to reschedule, as some people are showing sensitivity to colors following the vaccine. That, I haven't heard that, that's interesting. You know, that's that ground level information that might be urban myth, but it also might be something that's quite real because they're seeing that. So I, I'll have to ask around, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, here's a question I was gonna cover later, but I'll hit it now. So some of our employees think that because the AZ is less effective, they'll wait until they get a better vaccine get whatever vaccine you can get. The best vaccine you can get is the one that's in you. Um, and I'll, I'll show the numbers in a little bit, but the big thing is looking at efficacy numbers is one thing, looking at serious illness numbers is the other. Like I don't want to get sick, but you know, if I have flu-like illness and I feel like crap for a couple of days, okay. I don't want to end up in hospital. I don't want to be in a bed, right? All these vaccines do a very good job at, get, at preventing severe illness. The AZ vaccine is exceptionally good at severe illness and death prevention. So get whatever vaccine you, you can get, I think is the take home. Um, 
Yeah, so I think there are a couple of other vaccine questions. That I'll, if I don't hit them as we get through, we can certainly come back to that. I put, I'm not going to go into this slide again. This is just a reminder of control. And if you're thinking about what you do, because we still need to be thinking about this stuff at least over the next few months. So it's that control aspect of the three C's, close spaces with poor ventilation, crowded places with people nearby, and close contact within those settings. You know, and that defines a normal vet clinic in a lot of situations. So when we're starting to think about control and you start to thinking about, well, if you want to open things up, we still want to limit these three C's as much as we can. And you know, I'm not going to go into this as well, but this is, again, the concept that we need to use multiple layers of interventions. Vaccines are one of them, right? There are some Swiss cheese models of a vaccine, Swiss cheese right here. They are part of it, they're not the whole thing. You can't use one of these alone and control this endemic epidemic. You can't say we're just gonna mask and do nothing else, right? You can't say we're just gonna distance and do nothing else. Just like you can't say we're gonna vaccinate and do nothing else. So we have to remember that we have to keep using these multiple levels of interventions. And when one of those gets compromised for some reason, then we have to do the other ones better. And I just bring this up again because I think it's a messaging issue that's Unfortunately, it kind of got started off based on you know good intentions, but it's it's been a bit misconstrued. So I think a lot of people still might be in the perception that okay, you wear a mask if you can't be more than six feet apart. If you're more than six feet apart, you're good. And that's not the case, right? This virus doesn't go and then explode at six feet. You know, it travels farther sometimes as I'm talking, coughing, yelling, whatever. If I've got a high viral burden, I might send it farther than that. So the message is not, you know, wear a mask or stay six feet apart. It's wear a mask and stay six feet apart whenever you can. And this gets relevant in clinics, right? Where we do have situations where we have to be less than six feet apart. The other thing is the time component. So earlier definitions of exposure were often 15 minutes cumulative time within six feet. And especially with the BOCs, the more transmissible variants, you don't need 15 minutes. You can have very good, very short contact time and still become effective. You can have more than six feet distance and still become effective. So we're trying to maximize spacing. We're trying to minimize distancing. We're not trying to bring in really clear guidelines and say, yes, you're good here. No, you're not good there. Uh, I won't get too much into masking. I just wanted to talk about this because this was about two weeks ago, I think, that CDC came out with some guidance and it got a little bit misunderstood. Um, a lot of the news reports said that CDC is recommending double masking. It's not really what they said. Uh, they talked about double masking, but really what this emphasizes is the fit of a mask. So mask fit is really, really important. Um, and it makes sense, right? If your mask is loose, you're blowing stuff out the side that's not being filtered. And if you wear a second mask, that second mask is usually gonna snug the first mask to your face. So double masking will reduce the particles that are, that are um, you get out. But that's because of fit. It's not because you need another layer of filtering. Another layer of filtering is not going to hurt, but it's really a fit component. So a well-fitting single mask is probably as good as two loose or better than two loose masks. So really we need to focus on fit and properly wearing. You can wear five masks and if you don't cover your nose, you're not doing anything. If you wear two loose masks, it's probably not as good as one really well-fitting cloth mask. And some of the cloth masks fit much better than the medical masks. They seal a lot better. So I think we just have to remember that, you know, wearing them is important, wearing them properly is important, making sure they've got a tight fit is important. Adding a second mask, you know, it's never gonna hurt. Um, it's a little less uncomfortable to, depending on the mask. If you don't have a well-fitting mask, a second mask is a good option. If you're in a higher risk situation, then you might wanna think about a second mask uh, or moving up to a, a medical mask. Um, so what to do in clinics? Well, you know, we've got various options. We don't really know the relative efficacy of a lot of these things. I think a well-fitted multi-layer, ideally a three-layer cloth mask still works really well. That's what I wear most of the time. Uh, double mask is an option. Non-medical mask is an option. Medical masks are fine too. It depends on your access to them, right? We still don't want to burn through the whole supply, but fit is really critical. I'd rather have a well-fitting three-layer cloth mask than a poor-fitting medical mask, quite honestly, because I think it's probably for protection of people from me. Now, I've got the asterisk there by medical mask, because medical masks are considered PPE. So one of the things when we're thinking about exposure, you know, you get the question, have you been in contact with someone in the past 14 days without wearing PPE? So a medical mask is considered PPE in the context of were you exposed to someone, but a medical mask without eye protection doesn't mean you're protected. 
because I'm wearing a medical mask, I'm protecting my nose and my mouth, but I'm leaving my eyes wide open. So if I'm trying to say I'm using a medical mask because I can say it's PPE and I say I'm not exposed to an infected person, then I've got to have a face shield or goggles at the same time. Which isn't unnecessary, isn't necessarily a bad thing to do, but just think about why you're doing these things. But the key really is wear a mask all the time, have it fitting really well, and then you know pick the mask that fits best for you in the situation. And so that's for routine contact. When you've got unavoidable close contact, that's when you consider adding eye protection, consider a medical mask. So you have to get close to someone. So you're in surgery and you know you're gonna be in close contact, small airspace, you know, we're taking away some of these protective factors in the Swiss cheese. That's when we can increase our precautions. So eye protection, because I'm going to be close for that person's breathing on me, or I'm putting a catheter in or something like that. And consider amping up the mask protection. So we've got routine things, then we've got higher risk situations. So I'll just pause here and see if there's anything beyond vaccines. How many hours is a mask good for? Good question. We don't really know. Uh, we know we can reuse masks. The general guidance for N95s in healthcare has been kind of five days. It's been looked at and considered to be pretty reasonable. For me, it's less the duration and how we handle them. So if, if your mask is getting saturated, you're going to get straight through. So it's not going to be as effective. Um, if you're wearing a medical mask or an N95 mask, and you take it off carefully and you don't crumple it up and put it in your pockets. So you take it off and you lay it flat. That mask is going to last for a, quite a while. So if you're reusing a medical mask or an N95 mask, the big thing is being gentle with it um, and just taking a look before you put it on. If it's got creases, tears, anything like that, then obviously you get rid of it. For a cloth mask, for me, it's more like when they get saturated, then I've got concerns about breakthrough uh, and how long to wear it. You know, I can wear a cloth mask most of the day without any issue. Uh, I coach hockey, we wear a mask on the ice for hockey. It's soaked by the time I get off, it's probably not doing a whole lot. I tell me to get off the ice. So it really is situational. Uh, double masking, I guess I just got that. Um, and I think we'll try to hit all the vaccine stuff at the end. Quick update on the animal side. I'm not gonna go over all the species. Um, more wildlife species that we know are susceptible. Deer, deer mice, I think I mentioned them before. Skunks, um, reasonable collection of wildlife, not raccoons as far as we know which is good just because we think about the species that have closest contact with us in creating a reservoir. Because creating a reservoir means that we then need to think about animals, not just people in control. And it also creates a long-term reservoir for new mutants. So once you get a species jump, you got more pressure to mutate. And if you got transmission widely within that species, we're gonna see more mutants happening. So this is why we wanna keep it a human disease. On the, the mink side, we have those two farms in BC that were affected. Uh, still a big concern with mink farms for both widespread infection of mink, but creation of variants that can go back into people, which has been seen in Europe. We don't have a lot of mink farms in Canada, which is good, and they're pretty paranoid about this virus now, which is good too. Uh, dogs, cats, that's our kind of main concern clinically. So just a quick rundown on that. Cats we know are susceptible. Human to cat infection seems to be very common. If we look at our serological studies, we're looking at antibodies. Uh, a high percentage of cats are infected by their owners. Most of them don't get sick. We do see upper respiratory tract infection, usually fairly mild. Some can get more severe, but human to cat infection seems very common. Cat to human infection, we don't know. Um, cats can spread it cat to cat. So presumably they could spread it cat to person, we just don't know. In a household, it's probably inconsequential because if someone's infected and they infect their cat and the cat doesn't leave the household, the cat's not a source. Where we're worried about is when the animal leaves the household. So when they come to us or they go to a shelter or something like that. And that's why we need to query household status because you know infection of cats is fairly, fairly common. Uh, and there is a plausible risk there from a positive household. Dogs are less susceptible. Uh, still reasonable rate of infection of dogs, but they're probably or hopefully dead end hosts. We don't see illness much at all, if ever, in them. They're not as susceptible experimentally. They weren't able to transmit it. So we're hoping that they get infected, but it's a really low level of infection and they don't have enough virus there that they can pass it on. Again, still wanna be cautious because we don't know for sure, but I've got a lot less concern for dog than a cat. You know, the worst case scenario with a cat is you've got a cat coming from a known positive household and the cat is sick with signs that could be COVID, respiratory disease, diarrhea, uh, and you have to work around its face. So for some reason you had to intubate it or do an oral procedure, dental procedure, that's kind of the highest risk situation. And that's when we start getting into our higher PPE, which would be a mask, 
N95 mask, ideally an eye protection and gown in the whole shebang versus you know, a dog off the streets, very low risk. And happy to cover more of that side. I'll get a little bit more into the clinic management stuff after on. Um, I think I mentioned this before. We got, if you're interested in various species, we've got reviews done on lots of different species on Words and Germs blog uh, that goes over the risks or lack thereof with a range of animal species. Okay, so now what do we do with an exposed animal? So an exposed animal I'm saying is lived in a household with a positive person. Um, ideally, you know, we consider them like people and pets are people too when it comes to this because we're assuming that they're no more susceptible um, than your average person. Like this is a human virus. There's no indication to think that the cats and dogs are more likely to shed for a longer period of time or something like that. So we largely extrapolate from what's been there in people. So if an animal has been exposed to an infected person, ideally we want to isolate them for 14 days after that last exposure. So, you know, if, they're, if they come into a clinic or they come into a shelter and they're from a higher situation, we're looking at a 14 day period. So obviously in clinics, that's, that's a long time. Uh, where it gets a little bit challenging is when you've got households with multiple people and they're not all infected at the same time. Because, you know, the, with the infected person, so if, if, if I've got COVID, I have clinical signs of COVID, my clock for being infectious is typically 10 days from the onset of disease or my first positive test. Because after 10 days, when I've started to get sick, the assumption is I'm not shedding viable virus. Maybe I'm PCR positive, but I'm not shedding viable virus. So that means I could be infecting my dog and cat up until that 10 day window. So their clock for being quarantined really shouldn't start until mine ends unless I can be convinced that I am not isolating them. So I start, I start to feel sick today and I get diagnosed with COVID. Okay, if I just interact as normally with my animals and my family members, I'm infectious for 10 days. I might've still infected my dog on day 9.9. .9, so his 14 day clock starts on my day 10, right? However, maybe I say, okay, I've got COVID. I'm gonna live in the basement, right? I'm not gonna have any contact with anyone. The dog and the cat can't come down here their clock will start the minute I separate from them. So that, and it's where it becomes a challenge is when you've got households where, you know, one person gets sick and then someone else gets sick, but we don't know the status of maybe the other people. So like maybe I get sick and maybe my wife gets sick and I got three girls um, and they didn't get clinically ill and we just kept them locked down with us, but did they get infected and pass it one to another and still infectious actually the time my wife and I are free of the virus? We don't know. So essentially all you can really do is what you can do and we base it on the guidelines they have for people. So when the household's declared, you know, infectious, that's when we start thinking about, you know, how, how we handle the animal. We don't get into too many theoretical possibilities because it becomes a big deal, uh, a big mess. Because I think the really big question, the third thing to remember is, you know, we're thinking about a 14 day quarantine period after the last reasonable chance the animal is exposed. The risk is probably a lot in that early period but we certainly have seen some animals um, with persistent longer term PCR results. Does that mean they're infectious? We don't really know. So still a lot of unknowns on this, unfortunately. Uh, question comes up a lot about, I'll just see if there's anything there about the chat. Uh, actually, I'll hit this and then I'll get back to the chat. Uh, questions come up a lot about testing. So people want to get testing done and want to know when they should be doing testing. And you know, I've still got the same line, I guess I had back in the fall. Testing is interesting. It's rarely make it or break it. And it comes down to the degree of risk that's there. So, you know, testing requires an animal to be in the clinic. It requires us to work close to that animal. You know, when I'm sampling an animal, I do this in households where, where people are infected. You know, I'm there with an infectious person, but I'm also right in the face of that animal. If that animal is infected and coughs and sneezes, whatever, when I'm sampling, that poses a risk. And what's the benefit for that in a normal clinical situation? Not really any, right? So this, someone calls it up and their calf sneezing and they've got COVID. Okay, cat's probably got COVID. That's really all we need to know. What does a positive test tell me? It tells me the cat is COVID. It doesn't change anything I do with that cat in terms of clinical management, isolation of it or anything else. So is it worth the risk and the cost of bringing that cat into the clinic for sampling? Probably not. You know, we do it for research because it lets us answer the bigger picture, pictures. How often does it happen? How long do they shed? What are risk factors? So it lets us you know, provide some guidance. At the individual animal level, it doesn't really do much more than fulfill curiosity. You know, where it's more justifiable is when you've got the animal in front of you and you're sampling it for a PCR panel because you want to know something else, right? If you're doing diagnostic testing for something else, it's important for that animal and you know it's been exposed to COVID. 
um, then it's, you know, there's not a risk component there. So testing makes a little more sense, but again, ultimately, what's the benefit to it? It's more to fulfill curiosity than anything else. I mean, positive results tell you they're infected. Negative results don't tell you they were not infected, right? It tells you that swab was negative at that point. So still, there, there's not a lot of clinical benefit to routine testing. The animal's already in the clinic, and now you know it's been exposed to COVID, and you're sampling it for something else. That's the place where the, the, the risk is minimal, and the downside really is the cost component. So it's more justifiable there, but still, what's the benefit in the grand situation? Um, it's probably pretty limited. Uh, so I, sure, I didn't change that to clinics. So same concept in clinics and shelters. So how do we handle animals that we see that are positive or that are suspects really? So it's isolation. It's the same thing you're gonna do with, with anyone or any other animal in infectious disease. So we isolate them as much as possible. Ideally, we don't bring them in the clinic. Again, we try to defer anything from a positive household if we can. If they have to come in, you know, we're looking at minimizing things, minimizing the number of different people that handle it, minimizing the number of times that we handle it minimizing the duration of handling and minimizing the closeness of contact, trying to keep ourselves as far away from that animal as possible, especially during that initial period, because the period of risk probably, you know, it's, we say 14 days, but it's probably greatest within the first three to five days if we look at the experimental models. So even if we can delay things a little bit, minimize handling or a little bit, we're probably reducing the risk. And what to wear, well, typical PPE, so gloves, gown, you know, if we're trying to protect yourself, this is where we need to bring an eye protection along with our mask. So medical mask and eye protection or N95 mask and eye protection if you have N95s and are, and are ideally are fit tested, especially if you're doing an aerosol generating procedure. And this is where it gets a bit gray. Like if you're working around a dog's face, that's an aerosol generating procedure if they're panting or coughing or barking or they're releasing aerosols. So we maybe have a, a little more lax definition of what an aerosol generating procedure is with our patients than they would in people because our patients are a little less predictable in how close and how they act around our faces. Uh, and we've got this as you've hopefully seen in um, our latest guidance document through the OVMA. You can get that through the OVMA's website or through our worms and germs blog. And that's just an example of the tab table that goes through the situations where we use uh, different types of PPE. Uh, I'm going to jump to the got some vaccine stuff here. I'm going to jump back to the chat though. See what I've missed there. Um, how much protection is regular eyeglasses have? Well, they have some. There is reasonable data out there that people that wear glasses routinely do have some degree of protection. So my line with eyeglasses is, you know, they're better than nothing. If you're wearing eyeglasses normally in your day to day life, you're probably somewhat more protected than I, than I am because I don't. If I have a situation where I need to wear eye protection, you need more than eyeglasses because they don't cover enough. So they give you a higher baseline level of protection than someone that doesn't wear glasses, but they're not a replacement for eye protection in a situation where you need eye protection. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, are vaccine trials not conducted under standard and controlled protocols dictated by government agencies? Well, they're, they're conducted under standard protocols. They're not dictated by government. Well, how the trial is done and monitored, supervised everything is regimented, but how they actually use the vaccine and test it, that's up to the company. Um, so there's a standard approach, although with the AZ vaccine, they screwed up and they, they had some dosing issues. So there are some, we've gotten some interesting information because of some errors with the trial. Um, how can vaccine efficacy be compared? Well, this is why we try not to compare efficacy really. The goal for the vaccine manufacturers isn't to say their vaccine is better than someone else's or same as someone else's. Their goal is to say it's hits a bar, right? And really that bar initially was set at 50%. So are you gonna protect 50% of the people? Um, so there's not really, you know, ideally in the perfect world, we have the exact same model, but unless you did it at the exact same time in the exact same population, you can't really compare as well because there might be differences between the populations or the strains that are out there. So another reason that we're, we're careful in how we interpret some differences between strains or between vaccines. Um, apart from transmission, you comment on the pet's role in humans as fomites. So the whole fomites died. I'm really not worried about this virus in terms of fomites, but surfaces or anything. There's a lot of disinfection theater that happens. Um, surfaces just aren't a big deal. Like you can find the virus on surfaces, but not enough viable virus. Like if, if surfaces were a really big issue for this virus, 
the epidemiology would be a little bit different. You'd get a lot more exposure randomly in the grocery store and things like that, because all the people that were touching surfaces. Yeah, like if I'm infected and I'm not wearing a mask and I cough on my hands and I touch a doorknob and you're right behind me and you touch the doorknob and then you touch your face without a mask, that makes sense. That's really short term. But beyond that, the risk is really low. Um, the risk of pets, we were concerned about that at the start because we had no idea. And there were reports of this virus on surfaces and things like that. I have essentially no concern about pets here. But again, you know, if someone coughs on their dog and they're infected and that dog then sticks its face in my face or I stick my face in its hair coat, yeah, it's plausible, but the risk is really low. So I'm not too worried. You know, if I'm walking down the street and a dog comes up to me and I touch it, I'm not going to you know, hold my hands over my head and run home screaming until I can disinfect them, right? It's just going to be, the risk is exceptionally low for me. Um, how you recommend handling cats and dogs from households with COVID exposure? So hopefully I got that covered. Um, if that didn't cover those last couple of slides, let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll be clear on that. Should we use gloves hand, handling cats and examining um, their mouths? Well, gloves are, are one situation, but if you just wear, if you're wearing gloves as your only protective thing, I think it's gonna be pretty limited, right? Um, the other issue with gloves is we tend to wear them badly. Gloves just become an extension of our skin. So if you wear gloves, but then you touch your nose, and you touch your pen, and you touch your phone and everything else before you take your gloves off, and you don't wash your hands, you use a hand sanitizer after taking your gloves off, and gloves really haven't done anything. Um, we tend to misuse gloves as much as we use gloves. So if I've got a case where I'm worried about it, so a cat from a positive household, I'm working around its mouth, yeah, I'm going to wear gloves while I'm wearing a mask and eye protection at the same time. Just wearing gloves as a routine thing is never a bad idea when you're handling mucosal surfaces, but we, it's not really something specific for this virus. Let's see if I got through. Um, I think I, I'm, in case I missed one, feel free to, uh, are our vaccines good at preventing long COVID? We don't know. Latest estimate on long COVID is, I think it was 2.3% was the last number I saw, the estimated people that have, have signs that persist three months or more. So like there are, consider there are people that are infected, that's a lot of people. And there certainly is a lot of work being done, but when you look at vaccines, vaccines are highly effective overall. Um, so it's probably going to be difficult to see if, if there are issues with kind of rare outcomes. Um, so I haven't seen anyone looking at it in particular. Certainly vaccine trials are following the people fairly closely. I think the breakthrough is probably going to be low enough that we may not see much about it. But I think the assumption is you're preventing infection. Um, you're preventing severe disease. So if we're considering that a severe outcome, then it probably has some effect. It's not gonna be completely preventive because we're not preventing all infections. That's a pretty vague answer. I think it's probably because I don't know what to say, but I think we don't um, have a great idea on that. How close is COVID to fit? Um, long way away. Uh, so, and I was just reviewing this, I'm doing a, a, a talk for an ACVM course on COVID therapeutics and how they might relate to fit. And I think if you look at COVID therapeutics, um, the things that are working in people are largely things that probably wouldn't work in the pathophysiology of FIP. They're things that are used very early in infection. Uh, with FIP, we've got this chronic disease, right? So you've got some drugs that are used in people, but they're not labeled for use in severe illness or in late disease. They're more for that early infection component, which is different than what we do for FIP. The big thing for FIP is, is what we kind of knew before COVID is there are a couple of antivirals that seem to be exceptionally effective and a relative of remdesivir is one of them. And actually that drug is probably much better in FIP than remdesivir is for treatment of COVID in people. Remdesivir is a pretty crappy drug for treatment of COVID in people. The relative drug uh, that's been used in animals to treat FIP seems to be exceptionally effective. Uh, although we don't get much access to it because it's only available to the black market because they're worried about remdesivir but use of it in cats interfering with their remdesivir studies. So I think what we're gonna get out of this is a little bit of information on things and maybe some information about vaccination, but um, probably not a lot of effective therapeutics when you look at where they're used and the cost of them in particular. Some of these antibody-based therapies are, are exceptionally expensive. Uh, what to do with staff to refuse vaccination? This is tough because you, you see some very, I think there's, more support now for saying this is different than influenza, right? There are always debates about people that won't get flu vaccines in healthcare. And I think there's a lot more of a consensus that, you know, that's not tolerable. 
um, because this is a different disease. Flu is still underrated and it kills a lot of people, but this is, you know, flu times whatever. So I think this is going to be tested in healthcare because there's a lot, there is reasonable vaccine hesitation in healthcare workers in some areas. And there's a lot of debate about how to handle that. And I think we'll see it come to head in the summer or in the fall as this is still going on. Um, and we get people that will be able to get a vaccine for sure. And they choose not to. So I don't know at this point. I think it's really tough. I think it's easier probably when you're hiring than when you've got people that are in already on staff. This is where, you know, Doug Jack would have really more useful opinion than me, but it's something that's certainly talked about in all industries right now. Um, how do we position that? What's the risk that they pose? Now, the good thing about it is vaccination of yourself protects you very well against severe disease. So an unvaccinated person poses some risk, but not as much as if our vaccines weren't very effective. If our vaccines, were, if our vaccines weren't very available, or weren't very effective, it would be a different story. So we have to see where that washes out. Uh, sorry, I'm just gonna check my time here. Uh, what about contact tracing apps and tech in the future, reducing transmission of COVID? You know, these have been really variably used. So we've got uh, the COVID alert app in Canada, which still doesn't have really great uptake. There are various other things that have been looked at. In some places, some countries, they've got QR codes or mandatory QR codes on the door. So when you go into a restaurant or a store, you have to scan the QR code and that gives you ability to contact trace. The problem with any contact tracing apps and technology is there's an equity component because not everyone can afford the technology. Uh, not everyone can use the technology, especially with the technologies based on new generations of phones and operating systems. So, you know, this has always been talked about, do we, can we use these things to prevent the next problem? And this is where you look at things like as simple as, you know, Imodium sales and pharmacies any diarrhea sales in pharmacies. If you see a spike in Imodium sales in Guelph, maybe we have a foodborne disease outbreak we don't know about. So there, there will be more looking into trying to figure out how we can use some of these um, kind of distant ways to identify problems. I think there'd be a lot of a lot of looking back and trying to figure out how we could stop this and how we could maybe prevent the next one. There are a lot of privacy issues that come into this though too. So it gets to be a bit of a challenge. But I think there's still gonna be a lot of discussion about how we how we're able to track things and you know influenza other infectious diseases are inconsequential so things that we can do to track those or prevent those certainly have a value plans to vaccinate veterinarians well i think we're typically um you know the approach to veterinarians has varied between countries and between regions within countries we've kind of in a lot of places ended up in the higher priority of, of the middle ground group and if you look in places the states so they've been kind of a 1d um realistically Veterinarians are kind of a similar category as grocery store workers. Um, they're an essential service, a public facing essential service, um, but they're not working with in healthcare, in human healthcare, right? We're, health, we're healthcare, but we're not infecting people in long-term care. We're not infecting human patients. So we can't consider ourselves health, from my standpoint, can't consider ourselves healthcare workers from that component, but we do an essential service and we're front facing. Now you could argue that we're probably lower priority than grocery store workers because we can do more from a distance. So I think where we're seeing veterinarians come through in most of Canada is going to be just within that normal population. So that's their higher risk because of their health status will get vaccinated early. Most vets otherwise will either get vaccinated with a huge group of essential workers um, or everyone else. And the problem is, if you look at the comorbidity group, like the list is pretty vague on people with comorbidities for Ontario. And I saw one number that was about 5 million Ontarians would fit into a higher risk group based on how loosely they're described. And that's 5 million out of what, 15, 14 million people. And that doesn't include the people who would just say, oh, I have asthma, right, to get in there. So it's gonna be a bit of a free for all, I think, in that middle group of everyone else except for kids is maybe how it's going to shake up, but that's going to vary. The amount of vaccine really varies that. The more vaccine you get, the easier it is to be kind of wide open and get people vaccinated. The more, more it gets restricted, the more they have to be restricted, restricted in how they dole it out. So yeah, keep tossing things in the chat there. If there's anything I missed, toss it up. Uh, vaccine numbers, you know, we're coming up. Uh, move to see that. So two doses of vaccine. You know, we're looking at 580,000 in a population of 33 million. So, you know, we're coming. It's nice to see the curve going up. We're a long way from herd immunity. 
Um, I think we already covered this to a degree. So be careful looking at the efficacy level. Efficacy levels, prevention of symptomatic infection. This is the number you wanna look at, hospitalization and death prevention. AZ vaccine, which got bashed as not being very good. Yeah, they screwed up their trial. It's got pretty much 100% efficacy after two doses for prevention of severe disease and death. That's the key. So that's, this is why I say take whatever vaccine you can get. Um, you know, people would like the J&J &J vaccine probably because it's single dose, not as effective overall. I suspect when you get a second dose, it'll be up in the AZ range, but still for prevention of serious disease, like these vaccines are incredibly good. Um, and this kind of maybe ties into the last thing I'll have time for. Um, does vaccination mean we can stop wearing masks? Well, it's important to think about what vaccination does, right? It does a, a good job, not complete job, but a good job of presenting, preventing symptomatic infection. It does an exceptional job of preventing severe disease. What it does in terms of viral shedding is a bit less clear. So, you know, the general thought is, yeah, it's gonna do a really good job of reducing shedding. We're preventing some people from shedding virus at all. We're dropping the amount of virus that's being shed by other people, but it's not a guarantee. So if you have everyone vaccinated in the clinic, you're protecting the clinic really well. If you're well vaccinated, the implications of you getting infected are much less. So if we start to think about what are the risks to personnel, what's the risk of the clinic being closed and all that, you know, if all the clinic staff are vaccinated, it gives you more flexibility, um, but it doesn't give you 100% protection. And it doesn't mean you can't infect your family members or you can't infect clients. And if we did get to a situation where veterinarians were vaccinated, but your families weren't, then you gotta remember, you might not get severe disease, but you still might get an infection that you bring home to the rest of your family. So, you know, the, the messaging around vaccination is pretty changeable. And I think what we're saying for most people is once high risk people, once you've got your second dose in you, you can relax a lot. You can see the grandkids, things like that, because you're unlikely to die. When it comes from a transmission standpoint, we're not quite as clear. So I think when you get everyone vaccinated in the clinic, I think we still wanna to try to do the basic things that we're doing, um, the non-disruptive basic things that we're doing. We still try to wanna to limit number of people that are encountering because maybe we're infecting them, but it gives us a lot of ability to open up at that point. Uh, let's see, a couple more questions here. We're pretty much out of time, but I'll stick around if we still got the line. Um, let's see. Yeah, there have been some comments about the um, adenovirus vaccine. So similar to the, the ONRAB vaccine in some ways, this can be used for rabies. And it, yeah, so the adenovirus vector is a, is, a, is a tried and true method. Right? And that's why AstraZeneca did it because it was easier, it's well known, and it's cheap. And one of the things they've done with AZ is they've really positioned this as a vaccine for the developed world. Because uh, it can be handled well, easily, it can be made cheaply. You know, I think they declared they weren't gonna make a profit off this vaccine. Um, and realistically, we can't control this disease until we control it everywhere. If we ignore Africa, then we're just leaving a place for more mutants. So you won't get rid of this until you get the developing world done. And that's why some of those vaccines, like, like the AZ vaccine, are really critical for that. Any other ones that come along with that. Uh, about discussion of the intense post vaccine side effects. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, the, the amount of arm pain, inflammation, flu-like disease. Some people say it's not a big deal. You know, some people are laid up for a day or two with flu-like illness, uh, which means it's probably working really well. The risk of NSAIDs impacting the immune response, like the general line is it's not thought to be a big deal. NSAIDs aren't, any, aren't immunosuppressive, they're anti-inflammatory, and you don't need a tremendous amount of inflammation for the immune response. So, you know, we use NSAIDs quite commonly with kids when they're getting vaccinated. And that's not been shown to be an issue. And, and kid vaccinations are very well tried then. So I would have no problem with it. Um, you know, when I ever get around to getting vaccinated, I probably won't pre-dose myself with an NSAID, but if I'm feeling crappy, I'll probably take one. Does microwaving a mask work for disinfection? It would. Um, you know, the thing is this virus doesn't live very long. So there are a couple issues there. Like if you're if you're worried about disinfecting because you're you're worried it's got SARS-CoV-2 on it versus you're just worried about all the crap that's growing on it because, you know, sitting next to your mouth. If you're worried that it's got SARS-CoV-2 on it, then you gotta worry about your situation because what else might be contaminated because you've been breathing it in. Uh, that virus dies really quickly. 
So uh, I'll just shut my screen off so Ina can share hers. Um, that virus dies really quickly, so I'm not really worried about it. If you take that mask off and it sits till tomorrow, there's probably little risk of that virus being there. All the other stuff that's on there from your, from your microbiota and whatever else you encounter, um, microwaving has been looked at, as long as you obviously don't have something that's got metal in it. Uh, a dry oven, a low temp oven is probably as safe or maybe a little bit safer. Autoclaving brings in that steam component, which might be an issue with some masks because they've got an absorbent inner layer. If you're saturating, that might be a problem. So dry heat um, has been looked at a little bit more than microwaving, but microwaving has been used and it seems to be okay. More often though, it's a matter of if it's not a high risk thing, just leave it, let it dry out or launder it. So cloth mask laundering is, is the best way to do that. And if you can go into a hot air dryer, then that's gonna be a good thing. So maybe I got the last one there, then I'll shut up. Uh, what about taking vets and texts and vaccinating people? Um, yeah, I'm on the, if you need me, call me list for, for our area. So there has been an exemption granted to Wellington, Dufferin, Guelph in Ontario. And I assume that's available elsewhere to include veterinarians and vet techs and vet students and tech students in the list of who can be vaccinated or who can vaccinate. So it's being done in the US. When we get to the point where we have more vaccine than vaccinators, which we might hit, I hope we do, then I think you will see more calls for veterinarians to do that. The problem is clinics are pretty bloody busy. So if you wanna give up your tech to go vaccinate, that might be the fight some places have. But yes, it is an option in some places right now. And with that, I will shut up since I've gone late. I I <laughs> Thank but, you. Uh, again, Thank anyone you. has questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, I don't have the slide up with my email, but I'll toss my email in the chat for anyone who doesn't have it. If it's an urgent matter about COVID or anything else, put urgent in the title. So I don't ignore you. Or at least don't reply a week later. Okay, great. <laughs> thank, thank you. And, and just to comment on the vaccinators as vets uh, and animal health professional, professionals, we have uh, here in Quebec, which is where I'm from, uh, we are actually actively have many veterinarians uh, vaccinating. True to point, none of us have time. So it tends to be people, <laughs> veterinarians that are working in um, industry who are taking some time to do that or have retired, but uh, yeah, we're, we're out there. Lots of great stories of uh, veterinarians uh, vaccinating. Uh, so thank you again so much, Dr. Weiss. Um, very, very informative, great to have you back. And I'm really looking forward to our next town hall series. Uh, if you want to hear this again or wanna let people know about it, you can always go onto our COVID landing page and you'll see this as a recorded uh, video, which will be up in a few days, usually it takes a couple days to get it up. Thank you, everybody. I hope you are all well. Stay uh, strong and safe. And um, I hope that we get to see each other uh, very soon again. And I hope to see each other in person <laughs> at some point. But uh, in the meantime, thank you so much again and uh, take care. Thanks, everyone.